Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's July 3rd, so the news is full of news about uh, the Juno spacecraft, which is about to arrive at Jupiter tomorrow, and I figured it's high time I tried to do something like that in Kerbal Space Program. Now, the actual Juno spacecraft launched on top of an Atlas V back in 2011, I uh, do not have a full atlas for you, but I do have a Centaur upper stage, or at least some approximation of it. This is actually using the same uh, real scale solar system install that I used for serious business. And uh, Rhea, rather than try to figure out how to get it all set up for the latest versions, I'm just using this install. I've turned it into sandbox mode and I'm using the most awesome RL10 hydrogen engine that I can find. And on the top there is something that vaguely approximates the look of the Juno spacecraft, which is going to Jupiter to investigate the magnetic field, the plasma, the atmosphere. It's going to investigate the planet rather than the satellites. Anyway, the departure burn was not sufficient to take it all the way to Jupiter. It took it into an orbit which was uh, roughly two years in period. So that meant that in two years' time, it was going to come back to where Earth was. This is the first version of the satellite that I have here, uh, the, the space probe, actually. Just using plain old-fashioned uh, solar panels on this, just so you get an idea. Now, uh, the real spacecraft was actually spun up before the solar panels were deployed. And as the solar panels deployed, it actually slowed down the spin. I don't do this here because I completely forgot. But obviously Kerbal Space Program doesn't actually model that. Furthermore, those solar panels are kind of only half of what we need. Now if you've looked at the real spacecraft, you'll know it has the largest amount of solar panels of any interplanetary mission ever. It is going to go all the way to Jupiter and it's going to rely on solar power. It has three sets of solar panels and the total area is about the same as that of a tennis court. One of the solar panels is only about three quarters of the size of the other. So, through the magic of save file editing, I replaced it with this one. That looks a little more of the part. That there is supposed to be the magnetometer on the end there, and I built that using very thin procedural wing segments, and I think it looks rather good. Now, of course, the orbit that it's going on isn't going to take it all the way to Jupiter, so we need to set up a gravity assist. And the way they did this was they get a gravity assist from Earth again. So as they go out to Aphelion, they basically bring, they perform a retrograde burn, which slows down the orbit, brings the periaps inwards until it intersects with the Earth at a later position. And the important thing about gravity assists is what you're doing is you're changing the angle at which the uh, spacecraft is going with respect to the, the reference frame of the Earth. It's kind of complicated, but basically, if you if I hadn't made that adjustment, then you wouldn't be able to get anything from it. Now, the real trick here is to make sure is to adjust the encounter so that it kicks us into a Jupiter intercepting orbit. And I'm going to use the maneuver node editor here to poke around with it, and I spent a great deal of time poking around with this orbit until I got an encounter with the Earth, which kicked it into an encounter with Jupiter, and that was going to be the orbit that I'm going to use. And not it's obviously not the same as the real orbit, but this is as close an approximation as I could manage using my limited navigational tool set. Now, about a year after launch in 2012, the spacecraft performed this deep space maneuver to ensure that it encountered Earth in such a way that it could pick up more than the 500 meters per second of delta V that it was going to expend getting into this orbit. Now, of course, this is way simpler than, say, Galileo or Cassini, which performed multiple gravity assists between Venus, Earth, and Mars to actually get out to Jupiter or Saturn in the case of Cassini. Also, Juno didn't make any effort to intercept any minor bodies on any of these legs. It was essentially going right to Jupiter. It wasn't going to fly past any asteroids or anything. And one of the reasons is that the instrumentation was really designed to look deep inside Jupiter. The whole objective of this mission is to look very hard at Jupiter. In fact, the original mission payload did not include a camera. But in these days of social media-driven news, it was felt that if you were sending a spacecraft out to Jupiter, you'd better put a camera on it. So it does have a very small camera. The camera's specifications are not amazing. 
To get better than Hubble resolution, it's going to have to be within about 30,000 kilometers of its target. And because of the specific orbit that Juno is going in, it's only going to get great close-up pictures of Jupiter, but it's not going to get any new images of the satellites that are of any value, let's say. But it was tested during the Earth Gravity Assist. The Earth Gravity Assist was in October 2013, about two years and three months after launch, and the spacecraft travelled something like within 300 miles of the surface of the Earth. For the real spacecraft, periaps happened over Africa. In this case, it's happening over the Pacific, largely because it's very hard to plan these things with any accuracy. In fact, I'm not sure I'm even flying over Earth uh, near October, for that matter. Anyway, closest approach to Jupiter, the camera will provide a 15 km per pixel resolution. Uh, compare that to Hubble Space Telescope, which right now is achieving about 120 km per pixel. So, yeah, and that is obviously from a lot further away. Now, the camera, the visible light camera, is not the only camera on, the, on Juno. There is an infrared camera which is designed to map the aurora. That's the Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper, and that's a, I believe that's built by an Italian group. And they also have imaging sensors that work in the microwave and a, a spectrometer that works in the ultraviolet. So anyway, after the encounter with the Earth, I need to fine-tune this, and obviously not quite as good as uh, not quite as good as NASA. In fact, I had to uh, cheat a little here to make this work because I had a I was off by quite a bit to be honest after this. But uh, yeah, little burn to make sure I bring the periaps down to a few thousand kilometers, practically skimming the surface of of Jupiter. And you notice that we're coming up over the poles here. This is actually very important because if you want to get as close to Jupiter as possible, you are going to be dealing with a lot of radiation. Jupiter's magnetic field is very powerful. The magnetosphere traps a whole lot of energetic particles. And these get trapped into a donut-shaped region, exactly like the Van Allen belts on, on Earth, but way more dangerous. Now, these radiation belts actually make uh, Io and Europa very, very dangerous. And of course, Galileo space probe was zipping in and out of this, and, it, and you know, things start to break down over time. The instruments on, the, on Juno are actually given lifespans. Some of them are expected to only last about eight orbits, and some of them are contained in hardened radiation-proof, uh, you know, safes, basically, and that protects them from the radiation for the full 30-odd orbit mission. I ended up coming in over the South Pole. The real spacecraft is going to be coming in over the North Pole on the 4th of July, and it will be performing... About a 500 meters per second burn, I ended up having to do a 1 kilometer per second burn. So, yeah, not quite perfect on that front, but hey, it is just fun trying to fly this mission profile with the, um, with the various uh, gravity assists. Anyway, slowing down over the surface here, skimming the cloud tops, collecting scientific data. Well, actually, on the first pass, there may not be much scientific data to be collected because, of course, top priority is to get into orbit. And to do that, they use a Eleros 1B engine, which has a 635 newtons of thrust. It uses a hypergolic hydrazine and mixed uh, oxygens of nitrogen, or mixed <laughs> oxides of nitrogen. It's actually made by a company called Moog Inc., which I didn't realize this. They're an aerospace company based in America, but this particular engine is built in Britain. And the guy that started this company, Moog, is the cousin of Robert Moog, who created the Moog synthesizer. Of course, if you're British, you probably think that it's a Moog synthesizer, but I think uh, either pronunciation is acceptable. Anyway, as you can see, we put this spacecraft into this weird polar orbit. So it comes down through this kind of donut hole in the middle where it's able to get very close to the surface and it's basically threading itself between those radiation fields. Now, it doesn't have enough delta V to go into a perfectly circular orbit, so it kind of does this uh, big, long, elongated ellipse. The early orbits will be 53 days and I believe that later orbits will be 14 days as they bring it down over time. Now, because I'm using the Realism Overhaul solar system here, uh, Jupiter has its 
uh, moons inclined to its equator for all sorts of complicated reasons, mostly to do with the way Kerbal Space Program deals with polar axes. In real life, everything is all aligned. So yeah, look at this. This is what the spacecraft will more or less see as it skims the atmosphere, collecting scientific data with its large array of instruments. It is interesting. It's interested in Jupiter because Jupiter is, of course, kind of the first planet that formed, and because of its strong gravity, it's actually going to be much closer to its primordial composition than any of the other planets, which will have hydrogen depletion and things like that going on. Now, one of the big questions is how much water is there? What's the ratio of oxygen to hydrogen in the Jovian atmosphere? Because when Galileo visited, it dropped an atmosphere probe in, and the atmosphere, or the atmosphere probe found that the atmosphere was very much, very, very dry. And that's confusing. It, it made it very hard, or it constrained many uh, formation models, and therefore... Uh, there was a lot of question. Did they just hit a dry spot, or is the atmosphere really that dry, and does that make any uh, difference? Does that, what does that tell us about the atmosphere? Anyway, after orbiting Jupiter for 24 months, 37 orbits, the spacecraft will make one final burn at Apojove. What it'll do is it'll drop its perijove down inside the atmosphere and safely dispose of the spacecraft to ensure that it gets its grand Viking funeral, gets closer than it would really like. But given the interest in possible life on Jovian moons, it's been decided essentially that spacecraft that visit Jupiter are supposed to be disposed of safely afterwards so they do not contaminate potential sites. And so it will descend into the atmosphere and uh, burn up harmlessly. And that will be the end of the spacecraft and its three mascots, which it is carrying along with it on a journey from Earth. So the Juno spacecraft has the distinction of carrying the first Lego pieces into the outer solar system and ultimately into Jupiter's atmosphere. There are three Lego figures attached to it made of aluminium. We have... We have the Roman goddess Juno and her husband Jupiter, appropriately enough, accompanied by... Galileo. It's also interesting to note that uh, although the name Juno came because of the association with Jupiter, it has kind of retroactively acquired the acronym of the Jupiter Near Polar Orbiter. So anyway, as our simulated mission ends, we hope that the real mission will be successful. It will be arriving on Jupiter and uh, at Jupiter on July 4th, and we'll be interested to see if it makes that all-important orbital insertion burn. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.